Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing global broiling. Warming doesn't seem to cover it. And what's being done and by whom to increase it and to lessen it. Our guest, Helena Cobbin, is a writer on and analyst of international affairs. For two decades, she contributed regular columns on global affairs to respectively the Christian Science Monitor and Al Hyatt in London. Of her seven books, four deal with Middle Eastern issues and the remainder with other international issues. In 2010, she founded Just World Books, which has published 40 titles on Middle Eastern and global issues. Since 2015, she has been executive director of the Just World Educational Foundation. Ms. Cobbin blogs at globalities.org. Helena Cobbin, welcome to Talk World Radio. It's good to be with you, David. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Uh, it's kind of warm out. How, how, how hot is it now? <laughs> I mean, temperature um, records are getting broken worldwide over not only land masses, but also the oceans, which has, you know, and when you get a lot of heat on an ocean, you get a lot of precipitation that, you know, sucks up the water from the ocean and dumps it on, a, on the nearby continent. So a climate crisis is what I call it. And I think it's here. It's not a challenge. It's not like in the future. It's right here, right now. And in one of my recent um, essays on globalities.org, I use as a header uh, an amazing climate map that shows that there are four major heat domes over the northern hemisphere right now. And a heat dome is when the heat just gets trapped as people in the southwest of the United States are experiencing right now. I saw a story today as we're recording this, Helena, from Arizona of people coming into hospitals with serious burns from having fallen on the ground. Uh, and of course, like almost every article on this subject, it didn't mention global warming, what causes it, what could prevent it, what could s slow it, nothing, you know, just bizarrely, there happened to be people getting burned by the ground. Uh, <laughs> what's, what, what, is, what is causing this? Who are the chief culprits? What around the world, what nations are causing it? So I think Basically, you have to say it's capitalism and um, it's the unbridled use of the world's resources over the last 170 years, primarily by the capitalist nations in support of profit. Um, so part of this is fossil fuels, but there are other vital resources that have just been extracted and used and then tossed onto landfills all in the in the for the sake of, of profit. So some people call the present era the um, Anthropocene, which is a kind of like a geological term to tell you that it's different from the Holocene or the whatever the Cretaceous or those other eras that are laid down in our rocks. But I think it's more it, accurate to call it the Capitalocene, you know, because it's people have been on the earth for millions of years. And we didn't have global warming like this. There were fluctuations, but nothing as extreme as this. It is just the, like the, the rapacious pursuit of profit and, and extraction and use, unbridled use of resources that has led us to this. And you can see very clearly the historical data shows that it started somewhere toward the end of the 19th century. It accelerated a lot after the after 1950 and it's still accelerating. So um, yes, and which countries were doing that? It's the countries of the rich white Western world overwhelmingly. So I have a lot of um, criticisms of the New York Times, but I think the New York Times has gotten worse recently. And a couple of years ago, they did publish a really interesting graph, and I'm looking for it here, um, that indicated like the responsibility of various countries for global warming. And, oh, here it is. Okay, this was published by the New York Times uh, two or three years ago. And basically it says that 
23 rich developed countries are responsible for half of all historical carbon dioxide emissions, whereas more than 150 countries are responsible for the other half. Well, you need to remember that like the 23 rich developed countries, the white countries, let us call them, constitute about 12% of humankind. Amazingly, that is the same percent that were whites in South Africa during apartheid. You know, and they were in the era of apartheid in South Africa, they were controlling the whole of you know, politics and the economy and the society in South Africa. And the same to a large extent is true of the white countries now that are responsible historically for these CO2 emissions that are raining, raining what, havoc? <laughs> That's a terrible uh, metaphor. But really, it's the people in the global south who are suffering most from this. We need to remember that. I mean, it's, it's horrible for people in Arizona, I'm sure, and other US states. But if you were in Bengal or you know, in, in North Africa or in various other parts of the global south, you're going to be suffering a whole lot more from this. Absolutely. Isn't it also true, Helena, that within that 12% of humanity that's responsible for half of this disaster, or if not more, uh, there's some 1% of those people who are responsible for about half of that half? Uh, well, it, yeah, I mean, the kind of inequality within Western countries is, is notable. And, you know, the, the richer you are in the United States or in West Europe, the more you are consuming um, vital resources, including fossil fuels, um, you you know you take airplanes at a, at a moment's notice without thought to jet fuel emissions. You drive a car, large car, enormous great car. You you know you you're just you have a great big house. You have a great big house that requires you know air conditioning and cooling and uh, heating. All of that stuff, like your your energy footprint is much larger than somebody who doesn't have those resources. There's also some role here, and it's always struck me as incredible, uh, for one of the regions that's most quickly going to become absolutely uninhabitable, uh, that being the Middle East, where some of these rich white countries get the stuff from, uh, in large part, with which they're destroying the habitability of the Earth, right? Yeah, I mean, a place like Dubai or um, Qatar or any of the Arab Emirates or Kuwait, they are like really dystopian in many ways, you know, from the use of indentured labor, just like building these ridiculous things, whatever. By the way, I do like to call that part of the world West Asia, which is what it is geographically. If you call it Middle East, that's a very kind of Europocentric way of referring to it. But yeah, I mean, that is one place where you can see this dystopia definitely every day. Yeah, well, we're speaking with Helena Cobb and her blog you can find at globalities.org. Why have you not said the word China? My impression from US media is that Mostly it's anybody other than white European and certainly the United States countries, and it's mostly poor people and especially China. I mean, it's pretty much all China's fault, right? Well, that's what you would believe if you read the New York Times, listen to NPR, you know, the general corporate media in this country, which for some reason, and I don't know whether it's just because they're all part of what Ray McGovern calls the Mickey Mat, the uh, kind of military industrial war propagandizing complex. Um, but they want to hype up the threat of China, you know, just as they want to hype up the threat from Russia. So, you know, be very afraid of Chinese CO2 emissions, which, and here you're supposed to like gasp, are twice those of the United States. So therefore, it has to be China's fault, right? And then, you know, very few people remind you that actually the population of China is four times that of the United States. So on a per capita basis, their emission of CO2 right now 
is roughly half of what it is here in the United States. So that's one first thing that people really need to keep in mind. The other is that question that we addressed a little bit earlier about the historical responsibility of various nations and national groups for the CO2 that we see, you know, the effects of today. So China had been, according to this, this graphic in the, in the New York Times, responsible historically for 13.9% of the uh, historical emissions. So, you know, there, you could say, okay, right now they are having their emitting moment in history. Um, and the question is, what are they doing with it? And where is it leading? So there's a lot of great data out there that I just took you know, a few days digging for and you can find it. And it's nearly all available in Western sources. This is not you know, Chai Com propaganda from you know the chinese communist party this is you know solid data so one first thing i found on bloomberg is a a chart showing what china's plans for curbing and indeed eliminating co2 emissions by 2050. now david you and i hope we're still alive in 2050 our children and grandchildren certainly will be that is the year by which China is committed to having zero CO2 emissions. Yeah. Get that information from Bloomberg. How about our country here in the United States? What's going to happen to our emissions in the next 27 years? About the same, a little bit of an increase over what they currently are, you know, and that is from the US Energy Information Administration. So what the heck is going on here? Like, you know, why are we not going to China and figuring out how do you do this? You know, how can we do something similar to what you're doing and reduce CO2 emissions to zero? Instead of which last week, John Kerry went, you know, he's President Biden's um, climate czar and he and the national security advisor, um, Jake Sullivan was saying, you know, we're going to go and tell the Chinese about this and that and their use of coal. And, you know, the, uh, and so what, what kind of a response did they get in Beijing when they got there? You know, second rate, second level officials saw them and had a kind of pro forma meeting. And there really wasn't much to talk about because for the Chinese who have these very solid plans and a very solid record of having installed already a whole lot more solar and wind generating capacity than the United States has. So I'm going to turn here to another, <laughs> the printout of another of my pieces on globalities that has like some amazing, oh, I've, it's really hard for me. Anyway, I will continue to look for these great, um, hmm. This is what I want to, to ask. I, have? I, yeah. I don't know that you need that. Uh, China, it's great to have a plan for 27 years from now, but what are they doing now? Are they going up? Are they going down? You know. Okay, good question, David. So first of all, I want to come back to this question of um, large scale wind generation and large scale solar generation in China. Um, so they have installed, I, I'm not even sure how to quantify this, it's called 227,000 megawatts of operating capacity. More to the point, that's 52% of all the solar generating capacity in the world is now in China, 52%. As for wind farm capacity, 39% of all the wind capacity globally is in China. And, and the comparative figures for the United States, solar 11%, wind 17%. So, you know, they are already ways in advance of us in really building out um, solar and wind energy, renewable energy generating capacity. Now, when you build this stuff, you know, it does take, it does take um, 
you know, me metal and manufacturing and extraction and transportation in order to build a major solar farm or a major wind farm. So you're investing, as it were, resources in a system that will continue to run without resources. So that's one of the major things they're doing. And, you know, by comparison, oh, the other thing that I really love, because I'm a, I'm a kind of a railway nerd. Um, sadly, I don't get much chance to be a, a real railway nerd in this country, but I have been on like the high-speed bullet trains in, in Japan. I've been on the high-speed trains in Europe. And then you get on the Acela train here and it is sad how slow it is, how clunky, you know, how they, it, it's just not an efficient way of moving people at all. And, and it just travels between Washington DC and Boston and that's it. Whereas like in China, they have, I don't know, 75% of the world's high speed rail capacity and they're continuing to build it out. If you look at the maps and I do urge people cause I got all these great graphics on globalities.org, um, you know, the maps of their high speed rail system and then their local train systems and everything else. So, you know, what do we have in this country? If I want to get to Chicago, am I going to take Amtrak to Chicago, which takes, I think, 17 hours or Denver, which is 40 hours on the train? I mean, I have friends who do this because they are so, you know, worried about the emissions from airplane travel right but it's not a realistic way to build a country is all i can say you know to, to leave people dependent on either you know a large car or a uh, an airplane to get from one city to another is like very very bad for the environment and for your mental health i would say <laughs> well you have to get an electric car and then you have to get the solar panels it's a big individual investment you know can i, can I just say one thing about amtrak joe helena i was in <laughs> scranton pennsylvania yesterday and i found myself on the president biden expressway and it's 35 miles per hour this is not an expressway and there's not a there's not a non-antique train in sight it's it's Yet, I think, to be fair, the United States has hit 25% of the world's prisoners and 50% of the world's war spending. So this is another question I want to ask you is, what would be possible if not for war? Uh, and what is the role in all of this uh, fossil fuel uh, emission played by these enormous militaries? Wow, that's a huge story. Um... I mean, I think the first thing is that this climate crisis is here and it's global. So no one country can you know, address it. No one country and its immediate neighbors. It has to be a global campaign. Um, and therefore anything that divides you know, countries one from the other is gonna upset that, you know, the possibility of getting a global campaign. I mean, I was struck last year when the uh, the conflict in Ukraine started in February of 2022. Just prior, I think in January of 2022, there was the Glasgow um, Conference of Parties on, on climate change. And then later in 2022, there was the one in Sharm el-Sheikh, was it, or wherever it was. You know, those those conf international conferences dedicated to dealing with the climate crisis are completely hamstrung. There's nothing they can do so long as, you know, NATO is fighting Russia in Europe or the U.S. military is trying to assemble a, a military coalition to contain or fight China in the Asia Pacific, you know. That's what we need to ramp down, first of all. Those are all issues that can be resolved through negotiation in Ukraine. You know, I, I've kind of been rethinking Ukraine a little bit recently from the point of view of most people in the global South, you know, who constitute, let me remind you, 88% of global humanity. The conflict in Ukraine is kind of a minor tiff between two factions of the white world, you know, 
that's what it is. It's like, you know, something happening in Sudan, which where I have to say, the casualties, the human casualties are far greater than what's been happening in Ukraine. But, you know, the human casualties in, in Sudan do not get anything like the coverage or, you know, the, the obsession or obviously the, the investment that the United States is making in weapons of war to send to Ukraine to keep this thing going, which, you know, is just wonderful if you're like a major shareholder in Boeing or um, Grumman or any of the big five um, military industrial companies here. I, I think you're right, and I think it's extremely important, but the only, the only point I would push back on is that this one involves two governments with piles of nuclear weapons. Uh, and if it comes to that, and they, both sides seem absolutely insistent that it will come to that, everybody dies, the, the global South included. I, that's true. Yes. Um, the nuclear dimension of this has to be underlined, but still, you know, let's, that's even another, <laughs> another reason to resolve this thing through negotiation. I mean, yes. didn't we learn that in the Cuban Missile Crisis like 60 years ago? How has that learning been forgotten ever since? So, yeah. Um, and the other part of this is the relationship with China, obviously, you know, that China is, is going to do its thing. It's going to be reducing its, its emissions. It's going to be building out its railroads and its port systems to all the ASEAN countries and also you know, across the Indian Ocean. That's going to be happening. We as Americans should be encouraging that and working with it. You know, how can we look? In the last 40 years, China has eliminated poverty. It has actually raised 800 million of its people from poverty out of poverty. Can't we learn something from that? Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to think that we might because, you know, where I live here in Washington, D.C., on the traditional unceded lands of the Piscataways, um, you know, there are homeless people in tent encampments right outside the State Department and the White House. You've seen that. Like, we should be ashamed. Yes. We should go to whoever can eliminate poverty and say, how on earth can, could we learn? Learning is not something that comes naturally to the U.S. government, certainly not learning from anyone outside the United States. And I, I look at these statistics on carbon emissions and environmental destruction, and it seems to me that if the United States were even at the level of European nations uh, per capita, we'd be in much better shape. But when I hear from the very best, most progressive voices in Washington, D.C., the very best thing they ever say is that the United States needs to start leading the world on environmental <laughs> protection. Never that it needs to catch up, never that it needs to try to not be so far behind the entire rest of the world, but that it needs to completely reverse everything it's doing and lead the world. That's the, that's the best thing they will ever say. Where does this come from that the country that's the worst at things must lead the world why why can it never catch up or follow the world i don't know you know i've pondered this whole business of the united states has to reestablish our leadership in this that or the next thing and i'm like well is this does this go back to you know the manifest destiny that you know a white Americans are some kind of special people and a complete lack of self-awareness as as you kind of referenced but also if you're going to lead the world on something before you can be a leader you have to be you know a respectful member of the world community you know how about we we seek you know respectful membership of okay. the world community join the rather, world yeah yeah rather than standing out there and and just imposing sanctions on people and launching wars and doing things, you know, the American way. <laughs> I, we've got just a few minutes left, Helena Cobbin. I, I saw a story in the New York Times recently, and I agree with you that they managed to get even worse at some things. And it had a headline 
uh, to the effect that denial of global warming has burned up. It's, you know, radically destroyed. It's, and then they had these charts that showed over the years belief in global warming going up and down four or five percentage points. And it's just recently gone up four or five percentage points, but it was, you know, minimal. There was no giant upward swing in the graph. To put a headline on that, even if it seems like it ought to be true, that you can't imagine how it's not true with people getting burned on the sidewalk, but then to have the data that shows it isn't true, that people still disbelieve in the thing to more or less the same extent that they have for decades. Why is that the reporting and why don't people believe their eyes? <laughs> so um, I, I think there are a few things to say there. One is that for me, it's not a question of I believe or I don't believe. You know, I could believe in like green eyed Martians or whatever, but it's a question of, do I actually look at the data and the evidence and probe the data and gather it and draw a conclusion? It's not a question of belief. It's a question of informed judgment. That's one thing. But, you know, the, the New York Times and others like to put cast it in terms of belief. And so if a lot of people have come to this belief, which, you know, or have not come to the belief, which is not a question of data. Where, do, where are they getting their ideas? They're getting them from that same media that is, you know, trying to sell them all kinds of like the New York Times advertising is, is gross in its consumerism. Yes. You know? And <laughs> New York Times, like sometimes I read that little column they have on page three where they say like, this is how often you should wash your towels. And they're saying like, you should be washing your towels three times a week. Give me a break. Nobody in the world would think of that. You know, I mean, I, I towel off with a small towel and hang it up. And, and then, you know, every two weeks I wash it. Like their idea of how often you should wash your hair or like, it's right. just, it's just out of this world, the kind of the, the consumerist bubble that they live in. Why would they mean this when they have the SUV ads next to it? They, they <laughs> sure don't mean it, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's a big part of the problem. And, you know, there are ways that all of us can live a lot better. And we're not going to learn those if we just listen to the mainstream media. I mean, I have huge respect for those of my friends who don't take airplanes. I try to reduce my use of airplanes. Right. I, try, you know, try to cut back wherever. But us doing these things as individuals is not gonna is not gonna cut it. We have to actually build the movement that number one ends the wars because we never really got into the question of the terrible effects that warfare has on the environment. I mean, just see the the. the fumes spewing out of all these Bradley fighting vehicles and uh, it, to be terrifying. continued. We, yeah, we, I mean, I did actually publish a really nice book by uh, Gar Smith called The War and Environment Reader. And there's a lot of other great material out there showing the direct and indirect costs that war places on the environment. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you on, Helena Cobbin. You can read her writing and see her graphics at globalities.org. Helena, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Always good to talk to you, David. You take care. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.